Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Wherever, whenever you're watching this, it's time to begin Introduction to Animal Behavior with Mr. Henley. Now, I should have another video that you hopefully have already watched where you would go in and kind of understand how I have this course structured. Understand that the lecture notes and things like that will be done in YouTube videos, and you can make me go a little bit faster and hear my voice increase in pitch. You can make me go a little bit slower if you need to. With this being on YouTube, you can turn on closed captions. You can do all sorts of things. You can pause, you can rewind, whatever you need. This is kind of on demand for you. And I upload these to YouTube because most of us know how to work YouTube. And um, with YouTube, you can just do what you need to. The videos are there. I can add in playlists where I can add in videos because sometimes I'll have short videos and longer videos of me talking. And ultimately, I want you to be able to go in and see other clips and actually watch animals do stuff, which is not something we would do in the classroom. If we were in a face-to-face -face classroom, I would probably pull these up as video clips and show them to the class, but here I want you to watch them as part of the lecture notes. So let's kind of start off with a general question of sorts of why study animal behavior. And it's not just because it's fun or it's neat or, hey, I really like animals or anything like that. There's lots of reasons we can do that. And we're going to answer that all throughout this first section here. But if you think about humans and animals, we have a relationship going back centuries, if not millennia, and if not even, you know, dozens of millennia and things like that way from before. These are actually some prehistoric rock paintings that we um, are coming from uh, the Manda Guli Cave in the Nineti Mountains of Chad, Central Africa. Uh, camels have actually been painted over if you look at this very closely and you can kind of see the camel here as well you can actually see they've been they've been painted over because over time the 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 climate change and the organisms that were in the area kind of changed um, and we're no longer there as much anymore so this is a uh, an old view. I was trying to find a picture for this and uh, some of these places actually have replicas of these original paintings and they don't want people to go in and actually see the original ones because they don't want to damage them. And so they may actually have replicas that you go in and see. But uh, this was an uh, image that I got from uh, Wikimedia you know, as, as well. So anyway, like we said, humans and animals have a long history of working together. Now we do this for lots of things. The obvious one, of course, is meat. But we also do this for things like milk as well. So, you know, you know we get you know, food products from the animal, uh, eggs, for instance, which, you know, technically kill an incoming baby, maybe, but at the same time doesn't kill the organism, you know, so we have things that the animal provides us food that does in the organism's life, and we have ways that it provides us with food that don't in the organism's life. They also provide us with things like fur, silk, wool, things like that, that um, sometimes come as a result of the animal dying. Some things like sheep wool, you know, the animal doesn't have to die for us to get that. But we have materials that come from animals in many, many forms. But understanding animals and their behavior helps us understand the animals, how to work with the animals or to hunt the animals or whatever the situation may be, we can keep the animals safe if we are raising the animals ourselves we can use the animals to our benefit um, ultimately but you know we're humans so things are going to be typically human centric animal behavior is all around us and I would like for you as you go through this course to go around and just view the animal behavior that you see even if it's a something as simple as walking to and from your car Behavior is part of an organism that interacts with the outside world. If you listen, you'll hear the birds singing. You'll see spiders spinning webs. You'll see birds nesting and dogs barking. Lightning bugs light up at twilight during the summer. Bees visit flowers for nectar in the spring and summer. Dogs chase cars and frogs hop away from passerbys as people walk by. Turtles retreat into their shell. Cats bristle and yell at each other and yowl and so forth and caterwaul and things like that. All of these are things that animals do. And this is just, again, a small smattering of stuff. And every one of you has different environment at home. So I can only begin to imagine what you may or may not have experience with and around your home, at, around your home, around your school, around anywhere that you may be. Birds singing. Now think about it. Uh, a bird singing Think about when you listen to a bird singing, how you ask your questions in animal behavior is extremely important. We're going to be doing a lot of that in Unit 1, talking about proximate versus ultimate. But think about it. You know, a bird sings. Why does a bird sing? 
is it just because every time you're near? No. Um, it, how does the bird physically produce that sound? In the brain, in the vocal cords, the muscles that control those vocal cords, we can ask questions specifically about the physical um, demands of how the bird produces that sound. How has the bird learned the sound? Does the bird just innately know how to sing? Or did it have to listen to someone to learn to sing? Is there particular meanings to their various song? Why does the bird bother singing at all? And sometimes it's not singing, it's just chirping and so forth. I just recently found out that chickadees will actually alert other species and fellow community members that there's a predator, there's a hawk or something in the area. Apparently the Carolina chickadee, which of course is local, um, actually will say more of the chick sound to their chickadee song than they will the D's, depending on the size of the predator. There is actually research that's gone into this. Um, so is there a benefit to the singing? You know, here they're they're helping protect, you know, community members, maybe mates or even chill offspring, or perhaps they're just letting other animals know. Other animals that aren't even chickadees realize what these chickadees are doing. And I think that's pretty fascinating and interesting. Um, so does the bird song differ from other species? And in, in what direction, in what way does it? And even within a species, you know, we'll be doing experiments with the mockingbird uh, they have different calls within their own version, uh, within their own species, as, as we go. So, you know, um, I think the term is usually called conspecific, meaning within the species, um, with con specific, in this case, referring to species as opposed to um, the species. Um, like a particular thing. But at its heart, animal behavior is about finding answers to all of these questions. And sometimes it's asking the questions. What exact question do we want to answer? Are we asking it at a physical level? Are we asking it um, from an evolutionary perspective? Which is ultimately a lot of what we do want to be able to do in animal behavior as well. We do this by making observations. We do this by conducting experiments uh, within a strict scientific framework. Now, we won't be doing very much of creating experiments in this course because a lot of this is observational um, type behavior and things like that, but we will be analyzing and looking at some of the experiments that scientists have done in the pursuit of animal behavior and what that information does tell us, and sometimes maybe even what that information doesn't tell us. Like, what can we do to make the experiment better? And are there other questions that we can ask and, and maybe even answer as a result of those studies? But I'm getting ahead of myself, aren't I? Um, so, like I said, one of the big parts of this course is I want you to observe animals. And in fact, one of the three of the major assignments for this course are going to be, as I record this, observing a cat or a dog or another domestic animal. But, you know, cats and dogs are typically the most, you know, familiar. Maybe you have a guinea pig. Maybe you have a friend that has a hamster or chinchilla or something like that. That, that should work too. But cats and dogs we typically think of. Uh, the eastern gray squirrel. There are squirrels everywhere. Um, if you have an issue with this, you can go to, a, I mean, if you're at Granville Academy or you don't physically go to a school building, you can still go to a school building. Um, I know at Granville Central, we have gray squirrels that run around. Uh, you can go to like Vance Granville and go to the community, you know, go to the community college and go to the campus and just and be able to watch them as well. And similarly, the Eastern Mockingbird. Uh, I think it's the Eastern Mockingbird is the full name. Uh, but the Mockingbird, one of my favorite animals, uh, very territorial, a lot of personality with a Mockingbird. You have seen Mockingbirds around. You can tell they're gray. They have the black and white on their feathers. Um, and they, they want you to see them because they are very territorial. And I have taken two animal behavior classes in my time. One as an undergraduate at UNC Chapel Hill and once as a graduate student at NC State. And in both of the courses, taught by entirely different people, entirely different faculties, we had to observe mockingbirds. And mockingbirds just have a lot of personality, we shall say, in their behavior. But uh, just kind of give you a preview of some of the stuff that you will be expected to do in this course. In the early part of this course here, we're going to talk about Nico Tenbergen a little bit. And I'm probably mispronouncing his name a little bit, as I'll often say. But um, he is probably the father, if you would, of animal behavior. Uh, he's not the only one by any means. There are several names you may already know of famous scientists from animal behavior. But Nico Tenbergen is probably 
what we would consider the father of ethology of animal behavior. Um, and it, we have this quote here, the curious naturalist often feels sorry for those of his fellow men who miss such an experience and miss it unnecessarily because it is there to be seen all the time. Nor is reading about it in anything more than a poor substitute, direct active observation is the only real thing. Now, this is a school course. We can't obviously be out in the field the entire time. This is why you getting out there and actually doing these animal observations is extremely important. You need to do the science. You need to see the animals yourself and do this. You probably have done this before. You've probably watched an episode or two of BBC Earth or Planet Earth or anything like that where they do all of these animal behaviors. Fascinating, fascinating stuff of animals most of us will probably never see in a lifetime because they're in a whole different country continent, a whole different country. And it, some of these, you know, are animals that even people who specialize in this have difficulty finding and getting to. So being able to observe these animals is extremely important. And I will try to show you as many videos as I can without being, you know, really another video about this, but these things are fascinating. And I imagine that's part of why you signed up to take this class is because you find animals fascinating and you find their behaviors fascinating as well. Now, going to Tim Bergen's ideas, and we'll, we'll come back to him a little bit more, uh, a lot of his ideas go into two types of questions, and we'll be talking about this throughout this unit and even the beginning of the next unit a little bit. There's two types of questions in animal behavior. There's the ultimate questions, and there are the proximate questions. Ultimate questions are why, and ultimately these all go back to evolutionary history. Go back to evolution, why did the organism evolve this way? This gets back to the evolutionary history. Ultimate is evolution. Just That's how I remember it in my head. Ultimately, it goes back to evolution. These think of physical characteristics as evolutionary, but behaviors can be evolutionary as well. We know certain animals behave certain ways and being able to identify that. So survival value, ancestry, all of this goes with ultimate. Proximate is where most of our questions are probably going to be asked in this course. This is the hows, the genes, the hormones, the nerves, the things that we can really measure and look at and analyze. Uh, the sensory organs, the body mechanisms, you know, how does that bird sing? How did the moth know to avoid the bat? Things like that. And that's where we're going to get into a lot of the proximate questions that we hope ultimately will allow us to answer the ultimate question of basically how did the organism evolve to have this behavior. Uh, not all of this is physical stuff as well. So, a, a, you know, so, for example, why do we eat junk food? We have tons of junk food in our environment that's available to us. You know, junk food is called that because it's not that nutritionally valued. Uh, you have, but it has lots of calories. So as you get older, you start to avoid the junk foods because you know it really is something to that old saying: if you can walk by a, a Krispy Kreme and just smell it and gain three pounds, uh, it. I, I, I joke, but I'm not joking either. But high calories and v valuable for energy, but in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't do much. So you know, from an ultimate perspective we probably see the junk food, the candy bars, the things like that as something that we can eat and get a lot of energy, quick burst of energy, very valuable in perhaps an environment where energy wasn't so easily gotten or available. Proximate is how do we crave these things? And proximate would definitely be like our taste buds. Our taste buds, we tend to crave salty things or sweet things or savory things. Um, and so, you know, being able to crave different tastes and materials and sometimes you know sometimes we we realize man i want to eat something salty maybe our sodium levels are down or something that's going on inside our bodies so being able to do that as well uh here and yeah i took this photo from deposit photos i probably shouldn't have but you know they've watermarked it so we'll go go with this one i did try to use question um, photos that were common creative commons photos for the most part and um, apparently this was one of them, but you know, or maybe not, I don't remember. But anyway, um, giraffes have a long neck. Everybody knows giraffes have long necks. That's probably the main thing that we know to identify a giraffe. 
and they feed primarily from acacia trees and these acacia trees i don't know how well you can see that if you could i really don't have a way to zoom this in but you see these little white lines those are thorns and these are these long large thorns that are on this plant and the giraffe feeds primarily on the leaves that are between those thorns how does a giraffe feed well it feeds by its tongue it has a very long um, almost prehensile tongue of sorts now why it doesn't have much competition that way and it's probably better to survive and must be nutritious for the giraffe as well there must be some nutritional value caloric nutrients things like that that the giraffe is getting out of the leaves but there's a second question how so they have a very long snout and they're able to reach between those thorns and their lips are actually super thick uh, like rubber I've never uh, touched a giraffe in um, that way but apparently um, and I don't know if you can even do that at the Ashboro Zoo I know they feed the giraffes there but they also have a very prehensile tongue it's super long and some of their tongues can actually be as long as about three feet um, to be able to reach out which is crazy when you think about it hormones learning from parents all these nervous system being able to sense and taste all of these things go into why the giraffe is able and has evolved to um, specialize on these leaves at the top of the acacia plants um, that they eat from okay so uh, kind of wrapping up this little section here not the entire section just this this particular area um, so Nico Tinbergen has four basic questions about animal behavior and I do kind of expect you to know these I um, mean if it helps you remember CDEF um, CDEF C, C is cause D is develop F is function and E is evolve you know not in that not in the alphabetical order but um, so you know so what is the mechanism that causes the behavior how did the behavior develop now these first two questions here these first two are proximate explanations this is understanding the immediate cause of the behavior you know um, was it a neuron that fired was it a hormone that was released um, how did the behavior develop all you know being able to go you know did the animal learn it did the animal just come out of the womb knowing it all of these things are proximate just immediate hows or um, that we're dealing with uh, studies of the genetic basis hormonal triggers of migration behavior of birds all of those are examples of proximate explanations the last two what is the function of the behavior as in its function and survival value and how did the behavior evolve these are our ultimate questions again these go back to that evolutionary background um, these are require evolutionary reasoning they require evolutionary understanding and analysis and understanding the effects of migration on survivorship why do birds you know why did birds evolve to do this and why migration evolved are examples of ultimate um, explanations and trying to understand these things okay so we're going to get into uh, a case study um, of the bee wolf which I thought was actually very interesting I had not heard of this personally and then I looked at another resource and it was like all over the place about the bee wolf um, and this actually comes from Nico Tinbergen himself as well so before I get into this little section I want you to go watch this video and just learn about what the bee wolf is sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a wasp as well um, so you see actually the video title is bee wolf wasp attacking bees um, and I think from the name bee wolf you can kind of get an idea of what it does so anyway go watch this video if you're watching this on the playlist this video will immediately play next and then my next video will pop up after that and I'll see you after the click